Rat Rolls. No. Are you an aspiring Jedi? Or do you dabble with the dark side of the Force? Regardless of whether you fancy yourself a Defender of the Light or an aspiring Sith Lord, you're going to need a lightsaber. Podcast Stardust is pleased to partner with Saber Masters, the creators of high-quality, durable, and affordable lightsabers. Saber Masters is preparing to launch the Ultimate Lightsaber 2.0, and right now you can get two for the price of one. So, check out the link in our show notes and go get your Ultimate Lightsabers from Saber Masters. And don't forget to use our referral code STARDUST to save $10 at checkout. And each purchase using our referral code helps support Podcast Stardust. Hello there. This is James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you're listening to Dennis and Jay on Podcast Stardust. Their behavior is continuously unexpected. Hmm. So uncivilized. Star Wars fans, welcome to Podcast Stardust. This is the fully armed and operational podcast dedicated to Star Wars news, reviews, and discussion. I'm Dennis Keithley. And I'm Jay Krebs. Thank the Force, it's Friday. Let's kick off the weekend with a discussion of the Bad Batch. But before we do that, Jay can remind everybody where we can be found around the internet. Absolutely. And happy weekend on the on the move here. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and X at Podcast Stardust. Okay, the dish is aligned, the signal's boosted to maximum output, shield is down, and we are now broadcasting to the galaxy. This will be our full spoiler discussion of episodes 6 and 7 of season 3 of The Bad Batch, which are called Infiltration and Extraction. Uh, we're going to just talk about them both in one fell swoop, because this really is one story that they just split into two episodes uh, when it comes down to it. Jay, you want to go ahead and give us the summary for these episodes? Oh yes, here we go. Rex and his clones capture a mysterious clone assassin that attempts to kill Senators Chuchi and Singh. They find a data puck on the assassin, and among the targets in the encrypted data is Omega. Rex decides to contact Hunter and the Bad Batch. When they arrive at Rex's base on Teth, they are soon attacked by another Imperial operative and then an Imperial retrieval team led by Commander Wolf. Rex, Clone Force 99, and the rest of the clones evade the operative and convince Wolf to let them go once Wolf is convinced that maybe the Empire isn't so loyal to the clones after all. Mm hmm. So, again, it was two, two parter, very, very action heavy, uh, which has been a little bit different than some of the episodes we've had so far this season. What did you think about these overall? So good. And I did not realize that this was a two episode arc until I sat down to watch them. And so it was a very pleasant surprise because as you said, very action packed. And I know the first one was over in like a blink of an eye. So it was so great to be able to just head right into the second one and kind of get a, a little bit of closure, but mm -hmm. also a lot of opening as well to a lot of happenings that we are going to get to hopefully resolve. Yeah. One of the things I'm really appreciating about this season of the Clone War or Clone Wars, <laughs> listen to me, the Bad Batch <laughs> in and really the series is that while they have their series or season long and series long, I guess for that matter, story arcs, they have plenty of episodes that are self and contained or these two part deals that we've got right now so you can enjoy them without necessarily having to be invested in everything else that's happened all season long mm -hmm. and so i thought you know that was fantastic with this one it would certainly help if you knew everything that was going on in tantus and what happened in the clone wars and uh, what happened with senator singh back in season one and the like but you didn't have to know any of that in order to enjoy these episodes uh mm -hmm. so again that's something that's appealed to me about the bad batch overall no, I'd so, say that's a, a great observation and not to interrupt you there, but I was kind of thinking the same thing when we had Chi Chi and Singh there because mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this is really well done because it wasn't like they were, 
when they were having the conversation at the table, you were, you knew there was something historical that was important, but you didn't need to know what it was. Right. Agreed. So this episode starts off uh, focusing on Rex and some of his clone comrades, and they are escorting Senator Singh to this meeting with uh, Senator Rio Chuchi. And of course, Senator Singh, we met back in season one. He was a separatist center from uh, Raxus and the clones helped him against their better judgment since he was technically the enemy. And now he's meeting with Senator Chuchi, who is really an early day figure in the rebellion, the way things are shaping up. Right. They have this discussion about putting some sort of coalition together to oppose the emperor, but they note that they don't have resources. They don't have soldiers the way that the emperor does. So, but getting back to this, the, so there's a discussion though about working together because you know while they were on opposite sides during the clone wars now they now have this common goal which is independence and freedom uh, this is this is particularly well done i like the way that they brought so many different things together here and we talk a lot about filler and whether that term is applicable what it means and things like that and i don't even think these episodes that are being referenced were filler then but they're just being magnified uh, to how important they are. Oh, I totally agree. And, you know, with Chuchi as well, she was such a huge advocate for the clones and their rights and everything. And so, you know, I think just kind of that little idea that of knowing that is important going into this, but not absolutely necessary because you still, as you said, you still get the feeling that, you know, this is something that's important going forward to be able to oppose the empire and that there are people, there are systems, star systems and planets out there that are, you know, wanting to get together and oppose the emperor. Mm -hmm. Right. And they have no unifying leader mm -hmm. on their side right now. So I think that's interesting because we know who that unifying leader ends up being. Right. Mothma. Mm -hmm. And so it also just kind of reinforces this idea that it's a rebel alliance. It was created from different factions and different cells, and they didn't have an out in front leader for so long until Mon Mothma like outs herself, which mm -hmm. we see in Rebels, which takes yeah. place, you know, nearly 20 years, almost, uh, almost 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I liked all of that. That was pretty cool. Definitely. Then this assassin shows up and the cl clones call him something of a shadow. And the assassin is a clone himself. And he proves to be something of a task to try and take down, but they do manage to stun him and take him prisoner. Some other things, some things about this I thought were cool. One, they removed the uh, electrode device from its tooth mm -hmm. and how many people have we seen kill themselves by chomping down on a tooth and electrocuting themselves to death? Yes, yes. Whether it was in the Mandalorian and I think that happened in um, maybe previous season of the uh, Bad Batch. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yeah. And so, you know, so they're, they're making reference to that. And but then he's got a, a data puck, which is straight from the Mandalorian. You know, right. That's how the bounties were being handed out. So. Uh, some neat callbacks to other areas of Star Wars going on there. Oh yeah, a lot of great nods, and I just I love the name Shadow in in just in general because it can be taken in a couple of different ways. You know, Shadow mm -hmm. in that they're very stealthy and that they kind of fall into the shadows, and also as we see that they're kind of a shadow of their former self. So I just mm -hmm. thought that that was a really cool, you know, nomenclature for that. Yeah, and talk about your deep dives. They take this assassin back to Teth, which is the world we saw in the Clone Wars movie, where they went to attack the uh, Bomar Temple that the Separatists were hanging out, and the ATTEs were climbing vertically up the sheer side of the spires. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I did yeah. not put two and two together with that. Wow. Yeah, and it really strikes home when you get to the second episode of this two-part arc, and you get... Uh, the uh, second operative who shows up and you see the purple world, it's the same planet that they went to oh, Wow! in the Clone oh Wars gosh. movie. So That's that was fantastic. pretty cool. Yeah, I just but, remember just the, the building itself just kind of was reminiscent of something from like Tatooine, you know? Yeah. Java's, Java's Palace. Palace. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that was a cool place. You know, they've done that a number of times, you know, the rendezvous point for Crosshair and Omega with Hunter and Wrecker 
was that moon of Ryloth back from, mm-hmm. uh, you know, season one of the Clone Wars. And now we're mm-hmm. getting this here. So uh, anyways, I, I like what they're doing here. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because we sometimes talk about the small galaxy syndrome that Star mm-hmm. Wars falls into. But they go out of their way to introduce all of these new planets all the time, never to come back to them. But then we keep having the same characters show up everywhere. So I think it's cool that they're going back to some of the same worlds that we got to see before. And it was a nice touch to do that here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, it's fun to explore new places and, you know, new people and that type of thing. But yes, I think it makes sense to make a little bit more use of those assets. If you want to call them that. Indeed. So they can't get anything out of the assassin. He refuses to talk, but they decrypt the puck and they find that the uh, senators were on the target list. And so was Omega. And Mm -hmm. this is when Hauser, Set tells you know Rex that they need to contact uh, Hunter and Echo and uh, bring them in on this. And Rex doesn't want to do that; he doesn't want to get them involved. But you know, it's like we kind of have to because Omega's on this list. And so that's what happened. Echo brings Hunter and Rucker, Omega, and the like. They're a crosshair at this point to teth and it's not exactly the warmest of welcomes because hauser still harbors a grudge against crosshair for taking his men in back in season one of the bad batch when they refused to basically hand over the syndulas right yeah and can i just say i love seeing hauser again i was so Mm -hmm. excited and the first thing i thought to myself was whoop i'm gonna have to pull out my hauser t-shirt but you know (laughs) it's understandable that you know hauser would be harboring that kind of a grudge but of course rex is the voice of reason and you know kind of tries to put a little bit of a of a stop there and and tries to bridge the two of them together and say you know we're working for a common goal here so you know i i think I think that was good. That was, and and that was one thing I really, really appreciated. I just, I just need to pause and say this is just watching the dynamics between all of the clones and all of their different personalities in terms of, you know, the, the experiences that they've had and what that brought to the table at this point, you know, and it's truly a nature versus nurture thing. And not only that, but just the ability to be able to differentiate between all the clones, regardless of hair color or armor color or whatever, that you truly got a sense of their individuality. And I just, I dug that about this episode. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things I think we've talked about in the past is that with the, with the clones, it always impresses me how they can tell each other apart. Even like with the most minute difference between them. And and I think I equated at the time was you know, a lot of times that different races of humans can like can confuse other people, but they can always tell apart members of their own race. Mm-hmm. And and now, but you know, it's more impressive because they are technically genetically identical here right. in this case. But yeah, so they do that. But so they have this meeting, and Hauser's not happy about what's going on. You know, the crosshairs there, and he feels like crosshairs got uh, some answers. Uh, needs to answer for what he did there back on Ryloth. But in the meantime, we have this other operative that's been activated and uh, by uh, Scorch, the, the commando back on Tantus. And, you know, the uh, this operative says, you know, why have I been activated? And then he basically tells them, you need to go track down this other operative that was captured. And I, to keep them clear, I'm going to call the first one the assassin and then operative is the second one because they wore the same armor and they otherwise look identical. Sounds good. Well, they're both clones. So <laughs> naturally that's not saying much, but so, you know, this operative is found out the assassin and they have some sort of internal tracking that you can't detect, but it's an innovation and crosshair knows all about this because they tried to put him through this program and crosshair basically described it as you go through this program, all of your personality and individuality are sucked out and then you're turned into something else on the yeah. other end of this. And, you know, it, that was chilling and yes, it didn't work because, you know, defective is this thing. <laughs> That's what he <laughs> says. I know. I love that. And chilling, you took the word right out of my brain pan, honestly, because mm-hmm. that when he was describing this, you could just tell how disgusted Crosshair was with the whole process, but also he was trying to make a point, you mm-hmm. know, that this, this is how bad it is. 
Yeah. And uh, the exact quote is being defective is in my nature. So that was fun. Yes. Well, this is almost like the clones equivalent to creating inquisitors out of Jedi. Oh, good point. Yeah. I like that idea. Uh, that's an interesting way of putting it. And, but, you know, I just was impressed with how like alarmed crosshairs. It's like, we got to get out of here now. It's mm -hmm. amazing. The empire's not on top of us already. And, you know, he basically speaks it into existence because that operative is showing up. And first off, that ship he's in, I'm like, what is that? Like the stealth model, the Jedi Starfighter? Right? Yeah. That thing was cool. <laughs> Very cool. I know. I was trying to decide if it was like, if it was something like um, what Darth Maul had or, you know, but it wasn't the same shape. And then, like you said, it was kind of like a Jedi Starfighter, but very cool. Mm -hmm. And one thing we skipped over here is that before Echo left, he dropped the Maul off. He gave Omega this new energy crossbow. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of cool because she no Very longer cool. had her energy bow or whatever mm -hmm. it was called that she'd been using all that time. Yeah. Uh, but and the thing was, is like he'd been making a number of modifications and couldn't quite get everything done. But this was as good a time as any to give it to her. And but that kept her out of this room. And, you know, she came in. And so kind of the debriefing that Hauser wanted to do continues. And so these questions are being asked and. You know, Omega says, well, we left all these clones behind. I couldn't, we couldn't rescue them on our way out. Crosshair points out, you know, there's something else you should know is that not all the clones there are with us. A lot of them are working for the Empire and they chose to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this happens and that's when the operative attacks. He blows up the bombs. He's radioed back to the Tantus that he's got a sighting on Omega. And now a retrieval team has been sent. And that's how that first episode concludes any thoughts on that before we move on to the second episode well i'd like to know what that alternative method of tracking is that crosshair mm -hmm. was talking about because you could tell it was very alarming to him you know and he was basically saying that hemlock is is smarter than you think and so he was kind of putting that fear and trying to just put the exclamation point on it for everyone to say this is this is like super serious you don't get it but i would love to know what that is yeah, I mean, all I can do is just speculate, but I can't help but wonder if it's some sort of organic technology, kind of right. like the chips mm -hmm. that they had. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can't scan for it and mm -hmm. find it. And that's yeah. why, you know, cause the the chips that they had in their head were so hard to find because it wasn't like a hunk of metal sticking in the, out of their skull. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Okay. So the second episode, Extraction, there's, we could go step by step. But I want to kind of get to some of the bigger points here. There really is a game of uh, cat and mouse going on. Mm -hmm. Multiple games, I should say, because you've got this team led by Commander Wolf, of all yes. people. Uh, so he makes his Broke return. my heart. Yeah. Yeah. And he's leading the this retrieval team. I think I called it extraction. I meant retrieval. And meanwhile, there's this operative. And the operative is operating under the same orders which is to take omega alive mm -hmm. yet the operative like really goes rogue in going after the bad batch rex and the other clones that are there yeah so you almost wonder how much of that shadow like operative training was coming through and how much of it was you know almost like revenge in a way okay Let's talk about some things that happened there. There is a number of instances where Crosshair and this operative are going mano a mano in this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crosshair is ha exp still experiencing problems making a shot on this. He's, his hand still trembles and he doesn't have his aim back. He does make some impressive shots. He ends up bullseyeing one of the pilots of the shuttles that uh, is in Wolf's group at one point. But then they have this fight in the waterfall. And the operative is disobeyed Wolf's orders a number of times to come directly after Clone Force 99 and more particularly Crosshair. And at one point, uh, while they're going hand to hand and like he's trying to drown Crosshair, this operative says, you had your chance to be one of us. You chose the wrong side. And his voice is modulated and we never see his face. Mm -hmm. I have a theory. I do too. <laughs> Is this and I hope I'm wrong. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I thought. Oh my gosh, Dennis. Yes, I know. I was sitting over here just like biting my lip and bouncing up and down. And I'm like, it, it might be tech. It might be tech. So yes, I'm thinking the same thing. 
how do you feel about that if that were to be the case? Oh my gosh. I mean, this is the same kind of thing. I mean, they're kind of leading into that because of the whole reshaping thing and mm -hmm. everything that Crosshair said and the fact that, you know, it, it was so personal against these clones and against Clone Force 99 specifically mm -hmm. that I feel like there was a extra little like oomph, you know, in his shadow training to basically, you know, target these particular clones. So, yeah, I hope I hope we're wrong. But if that's the case, then that means that we could get tech back and we could get some redemption there, too. Yeah. OK, so I'd have to go back and watch this. But my memory is, is that most of the shots that this operative took were at Hauser and Nemec and Rex in Crosshair. And it wasn't so much Hunter, Omega and Wrecker there. OK, okay. so there's that. So that, you know, that kind of leans into this. And I can see why Tech might have this grudge against Crosshair. You know, the whole thing when Tech died at the end of season two, you know, as he was being ordered to get back up into the cable car. And he's like, you know, when did we ever follow orders? And so, you know, th you know that could be foreshadowing that he's not following orders here. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this is what's going around in my skull. I got to say, I really hope it's not Tech. I know. And I know. The there are a couple of reasons. One, okay, Tech was my favorite character uh, in the first two seasons, and I hated to lose him, but mm -hmm. I don't want to get him back this way. You know, mm -hmm. this Winter Soldier from Captain America. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> fashion here, you know, turned into some sort of a sleeper agent where he gets activated yeah. again. Because one, I just don't want that for Tech, and two, we just got Crosshair back from all this conditioning, and I really don't want them to repeat story beats that way mm -hmm. with Tech. It. I, let's let's That's move fair. on with all yeah. of that. That's fair. But you know what? I mean, I have to say, of course, we have the whole theme with the water again. Mm -hmm. And we've all we've talked so much about symbolism of water and what it can represent and that type of thing. But was there any portion of your being that kind of feared that maybe Crosshair would actually drown at the hands of this operative? There was a lot for of times, the same as last yeah. week, I thought Crosshair mm -hmm. could die at any moment uh -huh. in this episode, especially when things were happening, like, you know, he said he was going to go out and create a diversion mm -hmm. for, you know, and lead the, lead this operative away. And Omega comes back over the comms, like, I don't like this plan. And his response is too bad. Right. <laughs> I thought that was a funny moment uh, that, uh, you know, and after there was this whole bit earlier in the, there was all these like emotional beats they were setting up where when the ship, the leech ship that they called it, uh, got out of the spire and they got shot down by the operative. And when they got out of there, you know, Crosshair is doing the check-in with Omega. It's like, you, do you have your um, energy crossbow? Yes. Do you have this? Do you blah, blah. And then she turns around and says, you're as you're bad, as, bad as, as Hunter. And then he says, I'm so much worse. Yep. And, and then I he caught gets, that too. Yep. Yeah. He gets asked by Hauser, you know, you seem different than yeah. I And you know, so what changed? And Crosshair says, I used to be big about loyalty, but I realized I wasn't getting it back from the empire. And so, you know, that's what changed. And so there was all these things they kept hitting with Crosshair and it felt like, you know, this could be a send off, a goodbye. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then with all the, the moments you talked about, he nearly gets drowned and he still doesn't have his, his bullseye shot back yet. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there was that type of tension. And, you know, that's one of the beauties you get when you sacrifice a major character in a series is that no one going forward is safe. Right, right. Plus, we know that eventually we're going to say goodbye to the clones, you know, at some point. Mm -hmm. And so we we just know that it could happen at any any time whatsoever. But I have to say, I appreciate so much what especially these two episodes have done with, as you were saying, just these, these short little verbiages of, of statements that are so deep, you know, that mm -hmm. you, you can just put your finger on it and go, mm, like I can see where this is going or, you know, there's just so much being said within 10 words speaking a thousand, you know? Yeah. So and good. I just love what they continue to do with the crosshair Omega relationship. Oh, yeah. Because she's oh. got great relationships with each one of them. But with the first time we see the Bad Batch in the first episode, you know, Crosshair and Omega are sitting in those seats behind the pilot seat. And Crosshair's in his classic, you know, one hand up to his chin, messing around with his toothpick. 
-hmm. and there's Omega in the seat next to him imitating him. Yes. The same way she used to imitate Hunter back yep. at the beginning of the first season of The Bad I Batch. I caught that too. Yeah, and Hunter looks over her shoulder and sees that going on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she so models herself after all of them. They're her heroes. Oh, and, for sure. Her yeah. brothers. Yeah, and so, you know, she she looks up to them. And uh, now Crosshair has really caught her admiration. It used to be just she wasn't going to leave a brother behind, but now it's, you know, there's it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, they've been through a lot together, you know, mm -hmm. not that that they haven't been through a lot together with, you know, Omega with the other brothers, the other Clone Force 99 members, but there's just something so deep about what they went through getting out of Tantus. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Crosshair has never been this tender towards anybody. No. That we've seen anyway. Definitely. I mean, the closest came to be that uh, of Mayday, Commander Mayday from the right. Outpost episode from season two. But yeah. even then, it wasn't like this. It was right. more of a camaraderie and a brother in arms type of a thing. Mm -hmm, for sure. So they evade the operative long enough and then they get to their extraction point where they're supposed to meet Echo and Wolf gets there before Echo does. And Wolf had, up to this moment point had no idea that uh, Rex was there. And that was an incredible moment. You know, they both, you know, they, he comes charging out of his ship with all of his clones and his clone commandos and the, you know, they line up on one side and Rex and the bad batch and Hauser line up on the other side. And then Wolf is just like, all of a sudden like Rex. Yeah. You know? And I realize yeah. Rex has the distinctive armor and stuff like that, but you know, and Rex is just like Wolf. I mean, they know who each other were on site that way mm -hmm. and it just stopped them both dead in their tracks. Yeah. Th this gave me the chills because mm -hmm. I mean, just Wolf's reaction to the whole thing was kind of like a slap in the face in a lot of ways because one as you said he thought rex had died and he even points that out to rex and two you know he's seeing that there is another way and you know just that realization but what really kind of threw me off was the fact that these clone commandos were not even i mean i know he was their commanding officer wolf was but they weren't even questioning Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't even trying to be like, but sir, you know, we need to do this. They were just letting him talk. And every time Wolf said stand down, they would stand down. Yeah. And I think part of that is because Rex was talking to Wolf, but he's also talking to all. I mean, he's really addressing his words to all of them. He's right. like, think about what you're doing. Yeah. We, the Empire has a child on their target list. Let's be real. <laughs> What's mm -hmm. that about? Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when, one point, uh, the thought was, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, stumbling on my thoughts here. Wolf said, I'm loyal to the Empire. And this whole notion of the loyalty came up and what that meant again. And, you know, this notion that there are clones, our brothers being experimented on by the Empire at Tantus. And we're trying to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And finally, yeah, as you pointed out, Wolf said, you know, stand down to the men. And they both go their own ways. and Again, when Scorch says, you know, but they're traitors. And he's like, no, they're they're clones. They're our brothers. And we and then he says, let's gather their fallen, their clones. We owe them that. Yeah. So I thought this was cool because, you know, we I don't know if we'll see Wolf again this season of the Bad Batch. But the next time we see him chronologically is in Rebels. Mm -hmm. And he's with Rex at that point. Yeah, it's so, so great. So yeah. great. The way that they're intertwining all of these different things. And mm -hmm. I really appreciated the fact that, you know, they allowed Omega to speak up and say, you know, it's true. And mm -hmm. to kind of have her own voice in the whole thing. And kind of backstepping just a little bit when they were trying to explain, you know, what was it at Tantus that was happening? And the idea of the M count came up again. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, they were talking about that and Rex said, I, I don't know what that means, but it's obviously very important. So we're, they're just, you know, continuing to keep that at the forefront of our mind, which of course we, we knew, you know, from the past episodes, but it was just cool to see them kind of plant that seed again. Yeah. This season's just got some consistently great storytelling. Oh man, I'm telling you what, on. so good. So yeah. good. So, okay, we've gotten through the two episodes here. Um, some things that occurred to me is like, there's still like no mention of Sid anywhere in this season. Does that surprise you at all? 
Not particularly. What I'm more surprised about is that we were teased Ventress and we still haven't seen her. Yeah, and we got eight episodes left for that to happen, right? That's true, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but but we've also seen Fee in mm-hmm. the trailer, and we haven't encountered That's her true. Yep, yep. yet. There's an entire big action scene with a, that turbo tank that we haven't seen yet. So we know that's coming up here, mm-hmm. but at least with Sid, and I'm not saying that these guys would necessarily be out for revenge. That's not really their thing, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I just, I'm just kind of used to Star Wars storytelling coming back around to those type of things. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I mean, Fennec Shand is supposed to show up at some point. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about her. Yeah, so I don't yep. know. Maybe that'll all happen. And but we haven't had any teases of Sid showing up. But considering how big a character that was in the first two seasons, it does strike me as slightly odd that there's no mention of her in the third season. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess maybe we we could potentially get a little bit of a, a revisitation there. But I suppose Sid's kind of I hate to say, but she served her purpose. You know what I mean for the storytelling, and she had her place in what they were doing with the Bad Batch at the time you know, Mm -hmm. with her and them doing the little jobs for her and being in hiding. And now they've kind of moved on from that, but, and that's not the focus anymore. Kind of like to see her her come up and slow or get the opportunity for redemption. One of the two. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, and Hey, there's a lot to do in this. Well, we've essentially got slightly more than half a season left of this. Which uh, I'm so glad for, because sometimes these go by so fast and it is going by fast. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just, you know, kind of glad to be able to breathe and say, oh, okay, yes, we've got plenty of storytelling left. So that's And good. it's incredible how they made every episode count. Yes. There absolutely. aren't any little bodyguard Sid so we can go racing side adventures. Not that I didn't <laughs> like that episode from season two, but it wasn't necessarily a necessary episode uh, to the story of the Bad it, Batch. Yeah. It didn't advance anything super duper important at that point. the closest it came was the one character telling tech and records you know hey you know you did something great for sid there but watch your backs because mm-hmm. she won't likely do the same for you ridiculously bad paraphrase but you get the gist yeah. yes. and and you know and that was foreshadowing but we didn't have to have that episode for that that could have that in line could have been inserted anywhere mm-hmm. um again don't want to necessarily call that episode filler because it was a fun story it was a good story I enjoyed it but every episode that we've had this season, as you were just saying, has advanced the story somehow while still being its own great adventure. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Any other final thoughts on these two before we wrap it up? Oh gosh. I'm trying to think if there was anything that we talked about that I was wanting to go back to, but I can't think of anything. I'm so glad that you pointed out some of the, the trivia though, especially about Teth. And, you know, in the last episode about um, the moon of Ryloth, because I, I would never have picked those up. I well, appreciate that. oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I just when I saw that, <laughs> that Bomar monk style palace sitting on top of that mm-hmm. spire, I was like that. Please tell me that's from death. <laughs> and so <laughs> I when I looked up some images. I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> so Good uh, deal. It, was pretty, it was pretty exciting to uh, to find out that that was the case. Huh? Anything okay. else for you? No, no, no. I really enjoyed these two. It was fun watching oh, them. And, yeah. You know, can't wait to see what they got in store for us next. But uh, yeah, with that said, just want to thank you all for joining us for another episode of Podcast Star, on our discussion of this week's episodes of The Bad Batch. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did, then please consider hitting that subscribe button to Podcast Artists on your podcatcher choice. I'd also like to remind you, you can find all episodes of the show, all previous 702 over on RetroZap.com, which is home to several other great podcasts covering everything from the MCU to DC. Uh, the Dooncast just came back and that's there. And then there's Star Trek coverage and a lot of other things going on as well. As always, we greatly appreciate your five-star rating reviews on whatever podcatcher it is that you use that support such things. And uh, please don't forget to share the show and your favorite episodes over on social media as well. Uh, been having a lot of fun on YouTube, getting a lot of comments uh, there lately. So, uh, you know, got something to say. That's as good a place as anyone to drop it. Uh, but speaking of all these places, Jay, I want to remind everybody what those social media contacts are again and where else we can be found on the Internet. 
Absolutely. Yes. There's a lot of ways to get in touch with us, to interact with us, and also to promote the show and share it with others. And you can do all of those things on Facebook, Instagram, and X conveniently at Podcast Stardust. And we have tons of Pinterest boards just to have fun with and get some fun ideas for everything from fashion to lifestyle and everything in between. And as Dennis was mentioning, we have actually two YouTube channels. We have one on the regular YouTube and then our YouTube music as well. And so you can like and subscribe both of those. And as Dennis said, leave some comments and have some good conversation. And speaking of conversation, we are also on Discord. So if you are up for some real-time chatter over there, you can head to our show page, click on our community tab, and you're there. And there's also tons of other rooms to get involved with as well. And everything, everything geekery, you know, you, you've got it. It's over there. And then we also have a T Public store, and that link will be in our show notes. And you can get seven different show logo designs for Podcast Stardust on tons of different things. And every one of those uh, purchases does help support the show. And speaking of purchases that help support the show, and also your ability as a Jedi or a Sith, we are working with Saber Masters, and you can go to sabermasters.com slash discount slash stardust, or just simply put in the code stardust at checkout and grab an ultimate lightsaber 2.0 or anything else from saber masters. And you can save $10 on your purchase. And that also helps out the show. So Dennis and I just recently did a whole deep dive about our saber masters, um, ultimate lightsaber 2.0. And you can find that on our last episode of world between worlds, which was just this past Wednesday. So check that out. So Dennis, what do you got going on right now in your other podcast world, guesting or new episodes coming up here very shortly? So my wife and I are dusting off warp trails so that we can get ready to talk about season five of Discovery, which is coming out at the beginning of April. If you want to join us for that, then look for the Riches App podcast feed and then the episodes of Warp Trails will download there. If you want to check out our previous episodes, then again, head over to RetrosApp.com. And you can uh, find all previous episodes on the Warp Trails page there. Jay, uh, why don't you remind everybody of your busy schedule with cosplay? I know you've got a lot going on in in short order. Yes. And so, yeah, speaking of dusting off, I had to dust the EVA foam dust off of myself before I got ready to record. And so I am very busy, diligently working on my original concept Mandalorian right now, which I am going to be debuting at Fan Expo Cleveland here in April very soon. And you can catch all of my adventures on my Instagram, which is at j.snipscosplay. And you can always catch me as Ahsoka, Hera, the fourth sister, and um, just reliving a lot of different things from different cons over the past few months. And then April is going to be a really, really big month. So stay tuned and I'll be running down all the dates very soon. Okay, coming up on the show this Monday, we have Star Wars news. And then on Wednesday, we have the next installment of our Phantom Menace series celebrating the 25th anniversary of uh, that movie. So make sure you join us for that. So thanks for listening to episode 703 of Podcast Artists, everyone. Have a great weekend. And until next time, be a force. Be a force.